Welcome to this special edition of The Front Page. We're recording today because the news over the last 24 hours has revealed a massive upheaval at the top of British racing. Julie Harrington, the BHA Chief Executive, yesterday announced that she will be stepping down uh, by the end of the year alongside Chair Joe Sorma-Smith, whose term expires in the following year. That follows hot on the heels of Nevin Truesdale's announcement that he will be stepping down as the Jockey Club's Chief Executive and is one of a host of senior positions which are either coming vacant or are already vacant, including the head of Great British Racing, the head of the Racehorse Owners Association as well. To discuss this, to assess how Julie's reign as BHA CEO should be interpreted and to look at what it all means for the sport, I've been joined in the studio by John Harding and James Stevens. Welcome both. What do we make of it then? Let's, let's look at Julie first of all and Julie Harrington's um, time in office. She came in uh, at, during COVID basically when racecoers weren't allowed on course and since then has had to juggle a whole host of challenges for the sport, including the impact of affordability checks, declining crowds, et cetera, et cetera. What do we make of how she's handled it, John? I think you have to look at how she's handled it relative to the problems that that role poses in the mm. sense that it is very difficult to get agreement in racing, as we all know, having covered it. And the fact that she was able to get rid of that tripartite structure that led to so much stasis previously mm. and actually get people to agree to a long-term strategy for the sport. It sounds very simple, but we know in practice that's really quite an achievement to have got everybody to sign up to this thing. Yeah. Now the success of initiatives like Premier Racing will remain to be seen, but at the very least she got people looking forward and, and trying to work collaboratively. On affordability, I think that's probably one of the weaker areas. She's sort of allowed others to speak on her behalf a little bit. I know obviously the Racing Post was a big campaigner on that front and Nevin Truesdale as well was the one that launched the, the petition against the implementation of affordability mm. checks. So The BHA were involved in the yes. background. We should, we should give them some credit here. But I think often um, you know, affordability checks, which were you know, certainly identified by, by ourselves and by our readers as a, a you know, potentially a terminal threat to the sport was never really focused on in that same sort of, you know, laser focused way by the BHA. They all sort of saw it as one of many uh, juggling yeah. uh, tasks that they had to do. And thus, as you say, they did sort of slightly allow others to make the running on it for significant periods of time. Could have been a bit stronger earlier, I think, on that particular issue. But like yeah. I say, on the, on the actual, the governance and the strategy, I think, her main achievement will be that she got everybody loosely, or for the time being anyway, yeah. singing from the same hymn sheet. Great. And then James, she sort of wanted, she, you imagine she wanted to finish on a high, wanted to go out saying, we got the levy deal guys, mm -hmm. we did it. Didn't happen. No, um, it's an interesting situation we're in now because not only have we got a whole host of new leaders at the top of the sport essentially, but we've also got potentially as expected, 1 to 40, that Keir Starmer's government is going to take over. So mm. the position in terms of the future seems to be brighter, the fact that there is this collaborative structure in place, almost like she's laid the foundations of to what will happen next for the sport. But the reality is, is that there are still so many unknowns. And that's why when we talk about who's going to take this job forward, it's going to be really interesting because you've got all of the stuff with affordability, which is still unsolved. You've, we're going to have a new government and how they address that is, is one thing. The levy, as you say, it's, it's all got ready. It's almost there to go. And then we could be starting from the bottom again. And the relationship between government and the sport, that's going to start again. You know, we've got a Labour government probably coming in. Mm. All the signs suggest that's, that's absolute certainty that's going to happen. And we're going to have to form new links with... with and it's with going to be really tough as well because... Labour are going to come in, racing will you know, start trying to deepen and, mm. and, and enhance the links with, with the new government, but they're going to be doing so with a number of leaders who are leaving the sport within months. And, and, and if you're Labour, if you're the new government, with all the different challenges that presents, and you're 
engaging with a, a group of leaders who you know are not going to be in the, in the role for long, it doesn't exactly encourage you to invest a lot of time or energy into ensuring those, those relationships are, are working. No, exactly. And that, that makes that's another challenge. And I think anyone who does come into that role will have read all of the things that have happened in the last, well, I suppose, Julie, Julie's tenure, but, but further than that, about how racing has reacted and, and tried to solve its problems. And, and let's be honest, it's never clear. It's mm. never straightforward. There's in-house arguments. It's, it's not an easy thing to, to deal with. So the government could easily take a very sort of strict stance and, and try and do things their own way. You don't know. It's down to individuals, but it's definitely a huge challenge that we're going to have essentially one set of leaders, which is then going to change. And they've got their, they might have their own ideas and way of doing things. So it's a huge challenge. Just on some of the things you mentioned, um, I mean, overall, my summary would be it's been a hard job to judge because A, we've come in through COVID, affordability's come. Whatever Julie's vision may have been, she's just always had so many bumps thrown at her in the road. And, and, and that makes it sort of impossible to judge how that period has gone because you're just dealing with so many different things and affordability, COVID and, and mm. all the various strains on sports finances. Um, I think the foundations of that industry structure are good. But for me, the, 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 the thing I want to go back to is Premier Racing, which I think has been a real, real uh, shame. Yeah. I think it's a, such a missed opportunity, such, such a nice, good concept that's come about. Let's advertise a sport in a certain way. Let's promote it in a certain way. And for that not to get funding, which we've discussed in here, it's such a letdown because we've got a trial period of something which could really promote the sport, mm. really sell the sport, but it's been a complete waste of time because it hasn't had that funding. It's, it's so. almost been the worst of all worlds because what, what the sport did is it, it put a chunk of money into the prize money of Premier mm -hmm. Racing and then went, well, we're not going to do anything to advertise it. We're not going to actually support it or push it. And everyone sort of, you know, washed their hands of it, but only after investing all this money into it. So it's such a waste. But that kind of talks to the great challenge that any incoming leaders face in, in, in racing. Despite having addressed the old power structure, which really did cause paralysis, racing is still um, this incredibly convoluted sport where power rests all over the place. And even though we no longer have a situation where if one person doesn't like something, they can veto it, they can effectively stop something working just by withholding full support or preventing it being fully resourced. And, and therefore, whoever's coming in as the next BHA chief executive is going to be hamstrung in exactly the same way that Julie Harrington was by having to rely on other players all being on the same page and all backing a plan and then committing to it and staying committed, which we know is hard. Yeah, and I think the Premier Racing is emblematic of exactly what Julie Harrington faced in her role as, as BHA Chief Executive and indeed who the next person, uh, what they will face as well, because for all you can get everybody in the same room and sign up to a long-term strategy, getting them to actually enact it and stay on the same path together is incredibly difficult because race courses and participants are naturally naturally might be the wrong word, but they are often at odds. And you throw in the needs of bookmakers as well and things like the levy reform and actually getting agreement on anything is mm. incredibly difficult. Yeah, incredibly difficult. And, and, and I would like to see the next chief executive coming in with a focus on going further than Harrington did in terms of looking at the structure. I would like to see them come in and I would like them to say to the other parts of the sport, if you want to have a functioning long-term strategy for the sport, you need to back me as the leader to deliver it. I think there's an opportunity, but it's an opportunity which has a narrow chance of success because you need to get everyone on the same page. But I see this at the moment where racing will put in place the leadership team that is going to have to tackle all these major challenges and getting that structure right has to be the first step. It does, and it's decision making. That's, that's what it all comes down to. And there are two examples of, of decision making within this time as well, which we can look at. The first is the whip, where it's very easy to say, 
okay, well, the decision was made, the big report was published, and then eventually over time, things in that were changed and backlashed. And, and I don't think it's fair to say this is solely the BHA's fault, this is solely the PGA's fault, the jockey's fault. I think it was essentially the job wasn't quite done well enough so that all of the communication so that with the jockeys and the people who were making decisions were there and, and were clear and eventually we got through a point where the jockeys were saying well actually this and actually that and eventually we've come now to a point over time where mm -hmm. those rules have been accepted that, that shouldn't have happened that whole process shouldn't have happened mm. it should have been right we want to address this issue these are the changes we're going to make the jockeys have had their say and we've listened to them and that's and that's that that's final that's clear-cut decision which which we want to see in the sport not these rumbling ons and unhappiness because it makes it completely undermines the, the power of, of decision making. So that's something. But then again, the Grand National. I mean, let's look at the decisions that were made there. It was quite clear that, that something felt like something had to be done. This year was no fallers in the Grand National. Um, and the feeling among the sport was that it was a change for the better and the future of the sport and preserving that as a huge public spectacle. So that's what we want to see. And towards the end of the Harrington era, that's something that could be praised as a success for the BHA and all those relevant parties coming together to make a decision. We need more of that. But what, it, what we need from a leadership is clear understanding that we are in charge here. We are going to have to make the rules and we've got your best interests at heart. We want to listen to you but we can't just be impacted by everything because there are so many different bodies involved in this sport who all want different things and they are never going to agree. That's why we've come to this place. Let's finish by talking about who the next chief executive might be. I have here a uh, betting market from Bet Victor on it. Uh, some interesting names in there. Nevin Truesdale is the uh, runaway favourite, the outgoing chief executive of the Jockey Club. I would regard it as fairly unlikely that he's going to move over to the BHA. There's some names like Juliet Slot, formerly of Ascot, that often comes up in these things. Matt Hancock, an odd one. Um, uh, and, but, and, and, and obviously the long, the long odds value, Paul Keeley at 66 to 1. Um, Can you imagine? <laughs> I, I, I would love to see it. It'd be frankly. a fun I experiment, wouldn't everyone it? Everyone would like to see Paul Keeley, except possibly Paul Keeley. Yeah. Everyone would like to see Paul Keeley in that role. Um, listen, I think these markets are very difficult because there's a high probability that the person who takes a job is not on this list, either because um, they're, not, they're, not, they're just not familiar to the, the people who are, are putting it together, or, or more likely because they're not inside the sport currently. But what sort of attributes are we looking for there? For me, they need to have a certain political acumen. Ideally, they would have contacts um, within Labour. I might be describing someone who simply doesn't exist here, but I think they need to be politically aware. They need to be the type of person who is able to forge those connections at a time when there's going to be an awful lot of upheaval, as we've discussed. I think they need to be very well versed in betting. I think the levy negotiations between betting and racing show that you know there's you need to understand the bookmakers a little bit more and what they're going for. I think if you're going to get racing in a position where it's able to actually push back even mm. further and get a deal somewhere closer to the middle on something like levy reform. And I think they have to be, as you've discussed, they have to be in a position where they're able to actually make decisions because that is the ultimate paradox with the BHA is that it's viewed as this ultimate decision-making authority, yet it really doesn't possess the power people think it does. Yeah. James? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with everything Jonathan said. Um, respect from, from people with and outside of the industry is massive. Um, I don't think it necessarily has to be someone who is being involved in racing for, for, for out there or careers, working careers. I quite like the idea of someone who comes in from another sport, has different experiences, or indeed comes from a different jurisdiction and can bring certain ideas forward. I think you have to be flexible with these things. Um, I don't think, I think just looking in, within the prism of racing doesn't always help us. So um, look at other sports, what we can learn from them, and, and, but I think that relationship in terms of betting and politics is going to be absolutely crucial in the next few years. Agreed, yeah. The, interestingly, the job ad for the chairman position has appeared on the BHA website. Asks for experience as a chair or senior commercial leader, the ability to lead on both commercial and regulatory matters, an understanding of betting and racing and the links between them, strong contacts at government level and a passion for horse racing. I wrote that advert. There's got to be plenty of people like that out there, haven't there? It's, it's quite a demanding <laughs> brief, isn't it? Um, good luck to them.
Indeed. Well, if you fancy that role, £100,000 a year for two days a week doesn't sound too bad, but uh, if you've got to meet those requirements. So we'll see what happens and who comes into these big roles at the BHA and across the sport. And we'll be analysing and following all the developments on the front page and in the Racing Post over the coming weeks. Thanks for joining us.